everyone take your seat and welcome to Rotsio. Uh, Rotsio is an independent multidisciplinary research institute. Uh, we focus on devoting and pursuing research of relevance to enterprise and industry. Uh, today we are a cross-disciplinary team with people from political science, sociology, economics, and uh, with that, we have a broad range of different types of research. My name is Lotta Stern. I am the CEO of Ratio and uh, a professor of sociology at Stockholm University. I will be the moderator of today's seminar, and it will, as you can by now infer, uh, be held in English. However, uh, all our present presenters understand Swedish, so when it's time to ask questions, it's perfectly okay to ask your question in Swedish. Uh, and then they can choose whether or not they want to um, answer in Swedish or English. So the theme of today's research seminar is Finland and the decentralization of wage determination that has occurred in Finland. Uh, because all of a sudden, the forestry industry recently transitioned from having sector-wide collective bargaining agreements to instead having negotiations and agreement directly at the company level. The IT sector did something similar, although they chose a kind of hybrid form. Uh, and for Sweden, this is of course interesting to follow because we've had diff uh, the same type of um, discussion and interest in decentralizing wage bargaining in Sweden over time. So how has the Finnish outcome been so far? Well, that's the topic of today's seminar. And with us today, we have three excellent researchers who can you know, enlighten us about these topics. Uh, first and foremost, we have Antti Kauhanen. Uh, he is from the Etla Economic Research Institute. He's also a professor of economics at Jyväskylä University and teach also at Aalto. Uh, he's a labor economist and a personnel economist too. Uh, and he has written on the decentralization of bargaining and how that has affected wages and wage dispersion in Finland so far. But we also have with us today Lars Kanfors. Uh, he's a professor emeritus of international economics at the IIES at Stockholm University and a researcher at the Research Institute of Industrial Economics. He's, he was also the chairman of the Swedish Labour Policy Council, uh, more known to Swedes as the uh, Arbetsmarknads Ekonomiska Rådet. I had to look that up because I had no idea what, the, what it was called in English. So, and he has made important contributions to the understanding of, of collective bargaining overall uh, and its effect on the labor market, but also about the Swedish collective, collective agreements, wage, uh, wh why people are members of wages, etc. Um, most known perhaps for those of us in economics is the Kampfors Driffels, I would say almost modern classic model from 1988. Third, but not least, uh, we have Martin Björklund, He's a graduate student in political science at Linköping University and Rotsio. Uh, he's working on a dissertation about EU's energy efficiency policy, something along those lines. Uh, but he's also, together with Nils Konsson, the author of an, a Rotsio report that came out in 2021 about the Finnish collective agreement model. Uh, so with that, I very much look forward to listening to what these excellent people have to say. And I am going to first give the word to Antti. Okay, thanks for the introduction and for the invitation to present in this seminar. Okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, what happened in the Finnish uh, uh, couple of industries that moved to firm level bargaining and specifically I'm going to look at what happened to the level and dispersion of wages in these sectors. Okay, so what happened? In uh, October 2020, 
forest industries uh, announced quite unexpectedly that they will leave the sector of bargaining system and start to negotiate at the firm level. So, uh, to the best of my knowledge, this was a complete surprise also for all other employer associations. So no one had uh, idea about the, the plans of the forest industries, although they had been preparing for this for several years. Uh, this was a, this has potential to lead to big changes in the labor market because um, uh, these old contracts will play no role after they expire. There's no ultra activity because the, one of the uh, parties to the contract doesn't exist anymore as a contracting party. And also in the Finnish context, which is very important, and I'll come back to this later on, is that there cannot be any more a generally binding collective agreement in the sector. The law doesn't allow to extend a firm level contract. So this means that, uh, in principle, uh, you know, anything can happen for the wages. They can decrease, they can increase, the di dispersion can increase or, or decrease. Well, uh, everything is uh, on the table. Okay, so then technology industries followed suit in uh, March 21 by announcing the move to a hybrid model where there is a sectoral agreement, but then also possibilities for uh, firm level agreements. And uh, I'll explain in more, more detail later on, but in practice, this only affected the IT industry, where this hybrid model became a thing, so that there is a uh, uh, sectoral agreement, but there's also a wide variety of firm level agreements. So this is, of course, an example of a, a trend that has been continuing in the European countries for several decades, where the uh, collective bargaining systems they tend to decentralize, which means that the bargaining moves closer to the firm level. Okay, so what I do uh, in this study is that I, I studied the, uh, how this shift to firm level bargaining affected the level and dispersion of wages. I do all the analysis separate for, for different uh, existing collective agreements, so this means in this context that there's different analysis for the paper industry, mechanical, forest industries, and within these industries for blue colors and white colors. And then on top of that, uh, for the IT industry. There's only, there, that, or there was only one uh, collective agreement in that sector. Uh, so I use administrative data covering the whole Finnish population, working population, and their wages at monthly frequency, which is, uh, uh, makes this uh, kind of study possible. So now I'm, I'm interested in the impact that this had on wages, and that uh, brings a thorny issue that you know I can see what happened to wages in the in the affected sectors, but the difficult question is and what would have happened if they had continued sectoral bargaining? Because that's what I need to know to know what the impact was. And what I do here is uh, I statistically form a, uh, a control group, so try to guess that, you know, what would have happened if they had continued sectoral bargaining, and I do that by using all the other industries as a, as a control group, weighted in the way that the wage development has been very similar uh, prior to the uh, change, using the most recent methods to, to do this. Okay. I'm not going to talk um, in more detail about that, but uh, I think that that uh, is a pretty reliable way to do this kind of analysis. <coughs> okay, but about the Finnish collective bargaining system. So, similar to Sweden, uh, uh, we have basically sectoral bargaining and the uh, contracts have wide scope, so they not only deal with uh, wages and working time, but also uh, family leaves, vacations, etc. Many, many issues. And typically, most industries have different contracts for uh, for blue collar and white collar employees. The IT industry uh, here is an uh, exception. <coughs> Unlike in Sweden, the collective agreements are commonly extended to non-signatory parties in Finland, and this this decision is made by the independent committee. 
uh, independent of the of the social social partners. There are no strict criteria which determine that which contracts are extended and which are not, but the coverage is the key factor that the committee considers. So in most cases, if the contract covers more than 50% of the employees in the sector, it will be extended to all firms. Okay. This will be important later on. Okay, but to understand why the forest industry moved to firm level bargaining, uh, I'll go briefly through the, the history of Finnish uh, collective bargaining system. From 68 to 2006, uh, we had mostly we had this tripartite centralized bargaining system, with, which meant uh, the way it worked was that the central organizations negotiated first this sort of frame agreement, and most often government was involved either by promising new social legislation or wage cuts or or something like that uh, for moderate wage increases. Uh, there were, of course, bargaining rounds where uh, the coverage was not uh, high enough for this kind of uh, tripartite uh, uh, agreements, and then it was uh, only negotiated at the, at the uh, industry level. Uh, but this was the main mode for, for a long time. This changed in 2007 when the Confederation of Finnish Industries, the central organization for the, for the employers, announced that they will not be part, uh, take part in, in, in centralized bargaining anymore. So they disbanded their bargaining unit and said that, you know, now, from now on, we will uh, bargain at the uh, industry level. And the hope was to get a similar system to Sweden, where the, uh, there's a pattern bargaining led by the uh, export sector. This did, did not go well. So the first uh, bargaining round led to very high wage increases, and the wage increases uh, grew uh, as, the, as the bargaining round went on. And uh, especially in hindsight, this was very bad, because then the financial crisis hit. We have very high wage increases, low productivity growth, and there's nothing in the Finnish system that could uh, really uh, help in this regard. So, uh, that led to a uh, loss in, in uh, competitiveness, and the following rounds really couldn't uh, uh, restore competitiveness, so we got back to the centralized agreements in 2011. Uh, this wasn't supposed to be called anymore the tripartite tupo agreements, so, so they're now called the new centralized agreements. They were exactly the same as before. <laughs> and um, so this helped a little. Very low wage increases in these, these contracts. Uh, but the employer side wasn't very happy about this. Uh, following the 2016 agreements, the forest industries left EK. They didn't say that it was due to uh, these new centralized agreements, but I'm pretty sure that that was one contributing factor there. So now in 2017, EK changes rules so that they cannot take part in these centralized agreements anymore. So they bound their hands so that uh, this, uh, these new centralized agreements couldn't take place anymore. And what followed was uh, 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 industry-level bargaining rounds, which very much looked like the Swedish model. The export sector uh, negotiated first, and the others pretty much followed uh, those, uh, those uh, results. Okay, but then, in October 2020, mm -hmm. the forest industries left this system. And uh, the generally binding contracts uh, uh, expired. And this raised the discussion in Finland that, you know, what's going to happen to wages? Many people uh, forecasted that, you know, wages would drop by 20 to 30 percent. And, um, and there were really, well, that, that was the key 
prediction there that you know this is going to be very bad for uh, for the labor. In technology industries, this was sort of a strange move in the sense that um, because in most of their industries the the coverage is very high, that means that the sectoral agreement will become generally binding, and and so the first firm agreements uh, really cannot go below that agreement in any issue. And so the IT sector is the only one where the coverage is so low that the new sectoral agreement is not generally binding and that firms are free to uh, negotiate uh, with their uh, employees. What I think is important here is that it is still the sectoral union that negotiates the contracts with the firms. So it's not that it's only the local shop steward negotiating with the, with the managers. They can be involved, but, but still it's signed with the uh, national union. Okay, okay so uh, about the data. So this comes from this fairly new data source, Incomes Register, which is basically a real-time data source. You know, it's updated every night. Uh, at the sort of transaction level. Uh, what we researchers get is um, uh, the information at the monthly level for each individual. So it covers all their, uh, all their income. So it's detailed info on the wages. And this data starts from, from January 2019. So what I do with this uh, data, which is huge, I aggregate industry level so so my level of analysis is uh, is uh, industries here separately for the blue and, and, and white colors and I, I look at the total earnings so everything that they get from the uh, uh, that employment relationship so it includes um, also uh, performance related pay and all, all that kind of uh, components and I want to see what happens to the average wage what happens to standard deviation both within and, and between firms. Okay, so and here's, here's the results for paper industry. Uh, so let's start with the blue collar workers. What does this number here mean? It means that the wages for the blue collar employees are about 300 euros higher per month than they would have been if the uh, paper industry had stayed in the uh, sectoral bargaining system. Uh, the paper workers are very highly paid, so this is uh, about 6% increase. That is actually pretty much in line with, uh, with prior studies from, for example, from Germany or, uh, or Denmark uh, especially. We also see here that uh, the within firm wage dispersion increases. And uh, this is also a, I would say, substantial increase there, uh, although not, uh, not very huge. Okay, uh, but then for the, for the white collar employees, these estimated impacts are all much smaller. And uh, one reason for that probably is that uh, I cannot distinguish here between uh, clerical and upper white collar workers. Upper white collar workers have never had collective agreements in, uh, in, the, uh, in the paper industry. But these, these are much uh, more muted the impacts. Uh, although with all of these analyses, one, one problem is that these are not very precisely estimated due to the nature of the of the data you know there's um, quite a lot of uncertainty about the uh, magnitudes of the uh, of the impact but this is very different from the wage cut of 20 to 30 percent that uh, many well, people uh, forecasted uh, then for the mechanical forest industry uh, much lower estimates for the uh, for the blue collar employees, don't see much uh, uh, much of an impact there. Uh, these are very different uh, sectors, and for example, the average wages for the blue collar workers are much lower uh, in the uh, in the mechanical forestry industry compared to the paper industries. 
Similarly for the white collar workers, uh, the impacts are a bit larger, but uh, very uh, imprecisely estimated. For the IT services, there's only one contract. And uh, here, actually, the, the point estimates are quite large, but they are very imprecisely estimated. And But now it's good to remember here that it is about half of the firms stay in the uh, sectoral agreement. Half uh, move to firm level agreements. And based on you know, uh, news reports lately about the, about the contracts, uh, it seems that the, the contracts have increased wages at the, uh, the firm level contracts have, they have better provisions compared to the uh, central uh, or, the, uh, or the industry wide agreement because these IT service services they are different from many other industries in the sense that you know they publish their firm level agreements in, in most other sectors they are secret but many of these firms have them available at their websites and you can go take a look at what uh, what is in uh, inside there but also here as in the, all the other sectors all the point estimates are positive so the wage for the wage levels and dispersions, although it's not very uh, precisely estimated here. Okay, so what I find here that this, in principle, especially in the in the forest industries, big change in the bargaining system and uh, a change which might lead to large changes uh, in the uh, in wages. Um, but I don't find that large changes. Uh, I find sort of statistically significant results only for, for the blue colors in, in the paper industry. I would say that the, the results are quite similar to existing studies from other countries, uh, although the institutional nature differs a lot and the types of decentralization and all that, but especially the studies that use there are similar designs where you can follow firms or employees over time and just see how the, the systems change. This is quite, uh, the magnitude of the results is quite uh, similar. But I would like to emphasize that, you know, these are short-term results. This is one bargaining round. I look at the uh, estimated impact for about 15 to 18 months after, after the change. Long-term results may be very, very different. One reason is that, you know, negotiating why ranging changes to the contract might be quite difficult uh, in, in one round. And for example, in the paper industries, there was only one firm of the big ones that threw out completely the old contract and, and started from, the, uh, from scratch, that was UPM. The other firms took the old contract as basis and, and renegotiated the wage increases and some uh, sort of smaller issues there. So they are their idea is to then de develop it more incrementally over time. The other thing that the impacts, for example, on wage dispersion are likely to grow over time because uh, even if some firms would cut their wages and some would increase, in, within one bargaining round, on the average, it's not going to show up that strongly, but when that uh, impact uh, that will be magnified over over time because the uh, you know, the productivity, for example, of firms is quite persistent over time. And the third thing is that these changes might have productivity effects, but those will take time to materialize. For example, due to uh, working time arrangements. Those might lead to higher productivity over time. So these uh, impacts may be larger uh, in the future. Okay, but thanks. That was uh, what I have to say about that. Thank you so much. Ah. No. no. So, uh, thanks for the uh, possibility to comment on an important topic. Uh, recent Swedish discussion that has mainly concerned the form of patent bargaining. I mean, that's the 
determination of the so-called market uh, by the manufacturing sector and how binding that should be for, for others. Uh, but as Lotta said, in the 1980s and, and 90s, we had a very vivid discussion on uh, the appropriate level of bargaining. And that was after centralized bargaining between peak organizations had broken down. We had moved to uncoordinated bargaining at, at the industry level. And then in the early 1990s, private employers pushed very hard for, for decentralized firm level bargaining because they believed that would uh, uh, lower wage, wage increases. But such a transition never occurred. Instead, we got Industriavtalet, which can be seen as a compromise with continued bargaining at the industry level as the unions wanted, in return then for, for wage restraints uh, as employers uh, desired. Now, um, at this starting point here, that is, as we heard, it's a move to firm level bargaining in the forest and, and uh, technology industries in, in 2021 which allows them comparisons with, with the, all the other industries sticking them to, to industry level bargaining. Now, what's the, what should one take away from, um, or what do I take away from Antis analysis? Well, of five cases, there are no significant effects from decentralization that are found neither on the wage level nor on, on wage dispersion in four. And then there are significant positive effects only for blue collar workers in the paper industry. Uh, implausibly large effect, I would say, in such a short time. Uh, but I mean, that's what the data say. So, uh, <laughs> well, how should one interpret this? Well, I interpret this as saying that wage, incre wage increases are not lowered when a small part of, of the economy moves to, to firm level bargaining. But this does not necessarily tell what would happen if the whole economy adopts decentralized bargaining. I mean, it, this is a partial equilibrium, not a general equilibrium analysis. And the, the problem is, of course, as, as you indicated, that there usually are very strong wage links between industries. So wages in the industries adopting firm level bargaining are likely to have been very heavily influenced by, uh, by wages in all the industries that did not. And then in addition, as you, as you said, the, the period is very short. Okay, let me then move to theory. The paper is very short on, on that. It's, it's just noting that relative bargaining power between unions and employers may differ depending on, on the bargaining level. Now, this brings me to my own favorite theory, the, the compost treatment handshake hypothesis that we developed uh, 40 years ago. And to my regret, this is not mentioned in, in, in the paper. Um, despite, uh, I think, having become a rather standard theoretical starting point. And if I make a small digression, I remember as a young researcher how my own irritation when old professors pointed out <laughs> that I was familiar only with the research of the last 10, 15 years, but nothing before that. Or when some professor emeritus appeared at the seminar elaborating on his own research in the past. <laughs> Now, this is exactly what I shall do, uh, but with the excuse that I was explicitly asked to do exactly that. And of course, because I believe that uh, the, the compost treatment hypothesis is, is still um, highly relevant. Now, our idea was, was that the impact of, bar of, of the bargaining level is shaped by, by two opposing forces, internalization of externalities and, 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 and market power. And in, in our baseline model, of, which was of a closed economy without trade, then we, uh, then we derived uh, this uh, hump-shaped relationship between the body and the level and, and, and wages. Equally low uh, wage levels with firm level bargaining and, cent and with centralized bargaining and then with uncoordinated industry bargaining, giving the highest uh, wage level. Uh, it's a very simple logic. I mean, with centralized bargaining, wage setters take into account that wage increases in one part of the economy causes price rises, reducing the, the purchasing power of wages and profits elsewhere. And with centralized bargaining, these effects are, are, are internalized, and they, they, they then create an incentive for, for wage restraint. 
with firm level bargaining, that there are instead market forces that can restrain wages, as, as sort of very large wage increases in only one firm that will cause employment and, and profit reductions there. Um, because when there is competition, you can't compensate that by, by price increases. But then with uncoordinated industry bargaining, neither internalization effects nor market forces are strong enough to, to restrain wages. So if all firms in an industry without foreign competition raise wages, they can more or less compensate themselves by raising prices, as they can't lose market shares then to, to each other. So together, the, the, the firms in an industry, when they bargain together, have a lot of, of, of market power. Now, um, the world is more uh, complicated. I mean, there is foreign competition. And if that is very strong, if it's very strong, the, the bargaining level does not really matter because it will be impossible to raise prices even with industry bargaining without pricing oneself out of the market if there are um, because you, you, you will lose markets to market shares to foreign competitors. So in an extreme case, then the, uh, um, the, the, the uh, hump-shaped relationship will disappear. Uh, if it's not so, uh, uh, so, so uh, strong, the hump remains, but it will be, be, be flattened. But then there are also more effects that, 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 than just price effects of wage hikes that central, centralized wage bargains may, may consider. I mean, too large wage increases would reduce output and employment. This way, raise costs for unemployment benefits, it will reduce tax revenues. And wage rises for one group may make other groups unhappy because of relative wage concerns. I mean, taking that into account, um, the relationship could very well look like, uh, like it, this. Still lower wage levels with both firm level and centralized wage bargaining than, than with industry bargaining. But centralized wage bargaining is, is likely to give lower wages than, 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 than firm level bargaining. Now, I have not really followed empirical research on this closely in, in recent years, but when I did, there were lots of studies done using panels of, of, of countries and I would say that about half of them supported our hypothesis, about half did not, and found instead that more decentralization always raised wages, not only going from centralized to, to industry level bargaining, but also going from industry bargaining to firm level bargaining. So empirical research is, seems inc inconclusive. And by the way, I, I would say th this can be quite good for your academic career because then researchers continue testing your <laughs> hypothesis. They never stop. This gives many citations. That's important for, for academics. So it's a good advice for an academic career. That is to formulate a hypothesis that can neither be confirmed <laughs> nor <laughs> Well, but I'll still, I'll, I'll take, uh, and I'll, that's, that's, um, yeah, I can keep that. I'll take our theory at face value. And then it, I think it could account for developments in, in Swedish wage setting. I mean, in the 1950s and, and 60s, with, with very centralized uh, bargaining, we were somewhere at the right end point of, of, of the curve with, with much wage restraint. Then centralization broke down in the 1970s and early 80s. We had wage competition between private sector blue collar workers, private <coughs> sector white collar workers, and public sector employees. So we moved to the left uh, along the curve. And I, I would hypothesize that in the late 1980s and, and in, in the 90s, after the economic crisis, we reached the top of the curve with uncoordinated uh, industry level bargaining. But then, we had industry in 1997, which imposed patent bargaining with, with, with the manufacturing sector as a wage leader, determining this norm for wage increases that others have, have followed. And, and I can see that as, as a sort of a return back to, to, to the right end, uh, towards the right end point of, of the curve. It's not centralized bargaining of the old type with internalization of, of wage effects, but it's, it's coordination with rather similar uh, considerations, because, because manufacturing sector wage setters, they must consider that their wage increases determine wage increases also elsewhere. 
And then this in turn has effects on back on, on the manufacturing sector. So this is a tale, I would say, that you, that you can tell about the Swedish bargaining system and, and its effects. It's of course very simplistic, but I think it, it captures some broad aspects of, of developments. I'll end with a question, are, are your results, are they consistent with this uh, perspective? And I would say yes, and as the industries have moved to firm level bargaining, as I understand it, are strongly exposed to international competition, one shouldn't really expect much uh, impact, uh, I mean going back to, to, to this uh, picture when, we, when, when you have strong uh, um, uh, international competition. And there could be a positive wage effect, as you find them for blue-collar workers in the paper industry, if we are comparing, um, if we are comparing firm-level bargaining with industry-level bargaining, but which is quite uh, coordinated. Um, so I think I can square <laughs> your results with uh, with our theory. Okay, I'll stop yes, there. Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, so I will uh, talk about other things than, than wages mainly, uh, but uh, relating a bit to on the Kaunas report now, but also talking uh, in regards to the report Miriam Mills wrote uh, in uh, the autumn of 2021, before this panned out, kind of. Um, so, um, when we, we did a bunch of interviews with people in Finland about this topic, um, and we asked them about the reason for the development and, and stuff like that. And as we could find, there's explicit and implicit reason for the employer's decisions. Uh, on the implicit, explicit side, uh, we have the problems with competitiveness that Antti already touched upon. Um, but we also have uh, the, the, the desire for decentralization to adapt the, uh, collect the collective agreements to the uh, local uh, conditions for the specific firms. Especially in the paper industry, you have a bunch of different business uh, areas that require different solutions. Um, also, we have uh, uh, the explicit reason of getting rid of old and complicated clauses in the, these collective agreements. Uh, on the screen here, it's in Swedish, but um, this is a bust to leg, which is part of the old paper industry collective agreement, which a bunch of people talked about this as being a weird legacy that <laughs> remained. Um, so it's, it's kind of the idea is that if you have to work on a Saturday, you can't uh, go to the sauna, which means you're supposed to be paid more, it's as I understand <laughs> the addition. Um, so this was also kind of, um, the old ag agreement was also about 200 pages long and really complicated to understand. Um, and then a more implicit reason we found out when we talked to people in Finland is, is the, the frustration with this extension mechanism that Antti also touched upon. There's going to be some overlap here with, with Antti's report, of course. Um, this extension mechanism uh, made it even harder to adapt the uh, agreements to local conditions of the firms. So that was also a frustration that was behind the more explicit reasons about competitiveness and decentralization, I would say. Uh, so uh, since we wrote the report in uh, 2021, there's happened a bunch of stuff. Uh, Antti has touched upon some of it. I'm going to dive a bit deeper into the political and in industrial industrial conflict side of the developments here. Um, so, uh, as we also found out when talking to people in Finland about the relationship between unions and employers, uh, there's really poor negotiation climate. Uh, one person who was active, had been active in uh, both Sweden and Finland mentioned that there's a huge difference in, in the relationship and the, the um, possibility of agreeing with each other between the countries. And this can be, uh, many people talked about the historical uh, aspect of the civil war with red and whites, and also uh, uh, 
as uh, Carol and I mentioned, the income policy agreement or the, the centralized agreement re required almost always some kind of regulation from the state as well for the parties to get, get along. Uh, so this led to uh, a strike uh, of the UPM uh, from the Paper Workers Union, uh, PRO, which is the lower white collar union and the electricians union. Uh, the strike started uh, in 1st of January 2022, um, and there's also sympathy strikes uh, from the transport union. Um, uh, some limitations were put on strikes, uh, especially in production of district heating, since it was considered an essential part of, of the uh, society, uh, because it's re relating to energy. Um, there was uh, actually no intention of UPM to sign a collective agreement with the lower uh, um, white collar workers. And uh, as I understand it, they have still not um, signed any agreement there, but it's, un I'm un it's unclear the transition from the strike to uh, um, deciding on the terms individually. I'm not sure exactly how that panned out. It's not really obvious. Um, we also seen a lot of conflict in general during the uh, 2022 um, year, uh, especially in healthcare sector, uh, which uh, was quite militant this year. Um, also in the education and, and um, municipality services has also seen a lot of conflict. So uh, it's unclear exactly how this relates to the uh, development in the forest industries, but there's stuff happening in Finland, that's, that's clear. Um, so then if we talk about uh, the title of our report was uh, about Stöp, Sleabab. Uh, so then I wonder, like, are we seeing some kind of institutional change here? Or is it just uh, spikes uh, with a lot of stuff happening? Um, going back to the short-term results, if we relate to the wage increase in the blue-collar workers in the paper industry, I think one reason could be uh, that UPM, which is one of the largest firms, uh, firms in, in the industry, signed five new agreements with the Paper Workers Union, one for each of their major business uh, areas, I would, yeah, you could say. Uh, and from being an agreement with uh, 195 pages and a bunch of old weird legacy clauses, uh, you now have five different collective agreements uh, ranging from 71 to 79 pages. So it's, uh, it, as Antti mentioned as well, they completely redid the bargaining here uh, and uh, changed the collective agreement completely. Uh, we did not see the same uh, changes in Metze and Storenzo and the other smaller companies in the industry, which based a lot of the current uh, company collective agreements on the old industry-wide agreement. But this, this puts a limitation on what you can agree on, because in, in the law or of uh, the Finnish law, you can't um, diverge from the labor laws uh, with company level agreements, as it is right now. I will get back to that later. Um, and we also saw this kind of, not this, the ambition is still to have the export sector be leading wage, uh, being the wage setter. Um, but since the healthcare workers and the municipalities' social services uh, got a lot more wage increase this time around, it kind of questions the, the uh, leading uh, role of the export industries. Yeah, um, so there's a bunch of different theoretical ideas uh, around institutional change, if it can be gradual and endogenous, or if it requires some kind of external shock. Uh, I will not dive into that discussion here, but we can say that, see clearly that this is a deliberate attempt from the employer side to decentralize the bargaining system. Um, then it's up to, to <laughs> it's a question about, um, we have to see if they actually manage to do it uh, more widespread than just in the, in the forest industries. Um, there is also a, the question of political 
politics being involved in this development as well. Um, this new government in Finland has proposed uh, some labor market um, changes. Uh, for example, uh, they have explicitly said that they would promote the use of local collective agreements. Part of that is that uh, they are planning a change in the laws making it possible to diverge from labor laws with the company-wide agreement instead of requiring it to be a sector-wide agreement. Uh, this could change the, the, the thing I brought up earlier as, as um, we move towards decentralized bargaining. There's also some political proposals uh, to limit the right to strike in some ways. Uh, 2022 was a, a very conflict-ridden year uh, in Finland with almost one million days lost uh, to, uh, in industrial conflict. Uh, so there's a proposal for uh, limiting political and sympathy strikes and also during the healthcare uh, strikes and, and uh, conflicts there was a, a political proposal to implement a patient safety law that would limit the possibility for healthcare workers to uh, strike. Uh, based on the reason that it uh, compromises patient safety. Um, yeah, and then, of course, uh, Finland and Sweden, Sweden are always um, at the mercy of the EU. Uh, no, not, not really. But um, there are some aspects here that could also be relevant for both, both countries in the future. Um, some of them have... Um, been uh, realized in directives, while others are, are still part of the, the common agenda. But here I think uh, one thing that is interesting is that uh, in the minimum wage directive they talk about at parti in particular at sector or cross industry level, which would go against this move towards decentralization in, we see in Finland now. Um, yeah, and then in, in Sweden we have this, uh, this is really uh, hot topic right now, uh, the working time directive, uh, especially in uh, emergency services. Uh, this has been uh, discussed a lot. And I'm not really sure exactly how EU will impact uh, the trend toward decentralization, or even if the trend will continue going forward. But uh, we should not forget uh, that the EU has some, some potential impact in the future here. Uh, that's my political science perspective on this development. Thank you so much. So if I could ask all the three of you to stay here. I'm, I'm finally going to open the water. I guess I'm not a very professional host person. Uh, so we can actually get it with the water. Here you go. I'll move one over to our table, Lars. Uh, yeah, so I... As I said previously, uh, if you want to ask questions in uh, Swedish, that is perfectly fine. Uh, and Dennis will then walk around and give you a microphone, I guess. Uh, but if no one raises their hand, I'm going to start. So I'm going to start, and I'm going to switch to Swedish. Okay. <laughs> so, Antti, what uh, tror du kommer att hända? Tror du att andra sektorer kommer att följa efter? I think it is likely. Uh, I think many other sectors are, are paying close attention to uh, what is ha happening in the affected sectors. And uh, especially now, uh, it seems that at least in the IT sector, the employee side is also uh, uh, very satisfied with the firm level agreements. And um, it has brought the agreement, agreements much closer to the employee because now they are written for the employees. The, the, the style of text is completely different to the old, old contracts because now they are intended for the worker mm -hmm. to understand how this works. So, so I think that uh, not necessarily in the short term, but I, I'm sure that many other industries are also thinking about this whether this is something that they could uh, um, they could do. Mm -hmm. So what, what, is this something that Sweden should initiate? Should we see a new push uh, against decentralization? 
Ska vi imitera Finland, så att säga? Ja, ja det är en svår fråga. Det är kanske Finland som borde imitera Sverige. De har väl försökt, vad jag förstår. Nej, men jag står och funderar varför har lönebildningssystemet utvecklats olika i två länderna? Att det var ju ändå alltså ganska lika erfarenheter av devalveringar, för höga löneökningar och så vidare. Och 1990-talskrisen var ganska lika. Men varför så att säga, fick vi det här mer av en, en, en konsensuslösning? Och, och varför har man inte fått det egentligen då i, i, i Finland? Jag har ingen bra, bra förklaring. Jag tror det här inbördeskriget kanske ligger i... Alltså på något sätt förhindrar, som du var inne på. Jag var en gång gift med en finska, så jag tillbringade från en liten by på, på landsbygden. Och det som var mitt, mitt bestående intryck, tänkte jag säga, av det äktenskapet. <laughs> men, det var ju hur, hur liksom alla i den här byn visste. De kunde peka på vilken person som helst och säga vilken sida som ja, förfäderna hade varit i inbördeskriget, om de var röda eller vita. Jag vet inte om det, det, det är en väldigt grov förklaring. Men det ligger no- ja. men den är väldigt sociologiskt, tänker jag. Ja. Alltså, det här Absolut, liksom är en kulturell ja. Nej, jag inte betyder som sociologiskt. Ja, det är det jag ville höra. Ja. Ja, kan, ja, jag, jag tänker också att, att vi har ju en skillnad inom, inom facken. Att, att man hade ju en uppdelning av kommunister. Och, alltså kommunisterna hade ju ett större inflytande länge mm. i fackföreningsrörelsen. I Finland också. Och det kan gjort det svårare för arbetsgivarsidan att att möta där också, tänker jag. Och, och det... kanske även att facken har svårare att koordinera. Ja. Alltså, så att de blir svaga om de bråkar internt. Just det. Och det... Ja. Yeah. Uh, I also think that the, the, the tripartite system that continued for so long, uh, I have no you know, evidence for this, but this is my hypothesis, is that the, that the social partners were never actually able to figure out things among themselves. They uh-huh. always needed the government to mm-hmm. reduce taxes or, or uh, increase uh, uh, unemployment benefits or, or, or whatever. Yeah. And um, so maybe now, now that the state doesn't play any more uh, as large role there, maybe they have difficulty finding solutions sure. together. Uh, jag har en till sån här fråga som jag skulle vilja ställa bara som, som uh, um, handlar lite grann om, om um, konkurrenskraft och flexibilitet. Uh, det var ju två av de stora liksom, mekanismerna bakom att driva den här decentraliseringen. Där, för nu har vi studerat löner på något vis och, och sådär. Men, men kommer det här att leda till att Finland kommer ur sin konkurrenskraftslump? heter det kanske inte på svenska, men alltså, kommer det här att leda till att konkurrenskraften utvecklas positivt? That's, that's difficult to say. What, what will be interesting to say that if, if this uh, decentralization has any productivity effect. I think they are possible and, and uh, the examples I've heard that uh, what the firms have been able to do now that they were not able to do yeah. before, there are some, some signs that maybe it has some, imp- some impact, but how large that is, and uh, um, I still think that much bigger role would be played that if we could get the coordination system of, of collective bargaining working somehow <laughs> in Finland, that would have much much bigger impact than, than this decentralization part. Får jag skjuta in en sak här? Det finns väl en skillnad mellan Finland och Sverige och, och det är ju att fördelningen av löneökningar in, alltså inom företagen det är ju decentraliserat och har varit länge i, i de flesta kollektivavtal i Sverige men det är väl inte, har väl inte varit fallet i, i, i Finland och, och det kan ju så att säga innebära att det finns ett större tryck från arbetsgivarens sida mot decentralisering men här behöver man så att säga inte trycka på för det därför att så fördelningen av löneökningar och de effek- de med effekter på produktivitet och så vidare. Det, det sköts redan decentraliserat. Yes, I think that is one of the big questions that why why the 
collective bargaining system in Finland was so static for so long that even the contents of the contract didn't change. There wasn't anything similar to what happened in Sweden and, and Denmark. And I have no <coughs> good explanations for why that was the case, except the tripartite agreements, because that made it so difficult to develop the um, sectoral agreements, uh, because the, they were so so binding, basically, on the, on the cost side. Mm -hmm. so. yeah. And also, uh, um, do you have to understand? Uh, and then, uh, teknologiindustrin, när vi pratar med dem så lyfter ju de upp också den här viljan att, att och det var lite därför de valde den här hybridlösningen för att det var liksom ett, ett steg mot decentralisering men kanske inte lika radikalt och där var ju det de lyfte var ju att, att skapa möjligheter att bestämma lönesättningen på företagsnivå så att man har tydligare den här fördel, alltså möjligheten till företagen att, att sätta Jobba med lönen. Ja. Det återkommer ju som en ständig eh, problematik det där med lönesättningen på företagsnivå liksom, och hur det ska gå till och hur mycket kollektivavtalen styr det. Eh, jag har två radioforskare som vill ställa frågor, men massor med väldigt kloka människor från parterna här. Och jag tänker ni ska få första king. Är det ingen som vågar ställa en liten fråga? Ja, här kommer det en löpare. Äntligen. Ja, jag tänkte på det här med distorsiviteten. Mm. Ni, ni sa ju att det var en skillnad här i, mellan Finland och Sverige. Och jag har ändå uppfattat att det krävs ju en ökad distorsivitet för att det ska få en effekt mer lokalt. Hur ser ni på det? Finns det någon villighet från den sidan och ändra på de biten? Mm. Är, det, ja. är det någon som vill? Martin? Ja, alltså det är regerings programmet, om man ska kalla det, eh, som ligger nu, eh, så finns det ju en, ett förslag om att utreda möjligheten till att eh, förändra dispositivitetsreglerna i till exempel arbetstidslagen eh, och göra det möjligt att, att även på företagsnivå kunna avtala bort de, de delarna. Eh, så att det, det är på gång och sen vet jag inte hur det kommer realiseras, om det kommer göra det eller inte, men det är ambitionen. Och man funderar lite på om det, det är, liksom, är en reaktion, om det var något som fanns på agendan tidigare, om det är en reaktion på utvecklingen här i exportsektorn kanske. Uh, det vet jag inte. Har du inte lägga till? Yeah, it has been talked for a long time because it, the, the situation is very complex legally, mm -hmm. uh, how, it, how it works and uh, even the experts may have difficulties figuring out what can you negotiate locally, what you cannot and uh, And so, so I hope that this um, this new government will clarify the situation. It's, and it's very likely that they will uh, will ease the possibilities for local negotiations quite significantly. They might also write uh, into the law that certain things can always be negotiated locally, and that's of course something that. Uh, uh, Special labor unions are very fond of. Ska jag ge radioforskarna chansen att ställa frågor då? Johanna, Vicky och Nils har räckt upp handen. Vad sa du? Ja, gör det. Which I mean, 
drugs or chemical industry in general is much more internationalized. So this is uh, go back to the closer model and the open model mm -hmm. discussion as well, which affects the international pattern, impact to the local yeah. impact. Mm -hmm. So yeah. industrial transformation is affected. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Nils. inte bara är kamp om frittidsmodellen så att säga, för man hade ju centraliseringen, utan det var annat som drev fram den här. Jag tror på brytsbrytande flexibilitet och därmed brytsbrytande produktivitet tror jag var väldigt viktigt här. Och särskilt då inom industrin som genomgår ett stort beslutsskick från förändringar. Internationell konkurrens och så vidare. Ja. Där tror jag mm. den här utmaningen har svenska modellen också ja. spelat. Har ni några snabba sista ja. ord om, om strukturomvandling och digitalisering och ja, teknikskiften egentligen? Yeah, so, so I think that, that was one of the big reasons why, why the paper industry uh, or forest industry, especially paper industry, wanted to leave the mm. sectoral mm. vitamin system because they have so diverse businesses and they have the old contract which mm. is very yeah. difficult to you know, adapt to the new needs. It, it's based on decades long tradition based, uh, on, on paper mills and uh, now you have a biorefinery and you look at the contract and the <laughs> business line and you know they don't really yeah. discuss together at all. So, yeah. mm, so that's, the, that's the difficulty there. Har ni något klokt att tillägga? Ja, ja, ja. Ett tillägg bara mm. att uh, det är också egentligen mer en fråga men Alltså Finland har ju mycket starkare incitament egentligen än Sverige att, att få en mm. välfungerande lönebildning därför att man har euron mm. och man kan inte rädda så att säga av en växelkurs. Så det, det är också en liten gåta ja, att det inte har tvingat fram mer omvandlingstryck i, i, på, på mm. lönebildningsprocessen. Jag kan också bara det här med, med att kunna öka flexibiliteten. Jag vet inte hur det funkar med liksom uppsägningar och sånt i de nya kontrakten. Alltså, mm. för det är också en sån här grej om man ska skifta från en ja, skifta anställda till, från en liksom, business area till en annan så kan det vara en fördel att ha separata så att man inte måste liksom, avtala, köra allting på en gång utan man kan köra på separata eh, företagsområden. Liksom. Ja. ja, det får bli vår uh, slutord idag. I i egenskap av tidhållare. <laughs> eh, någorlunda husat sådant kan man väl säga. Eh, jag vill passa på att tacka fantastiskt bra dragningar måste jag säga. Tycker jag. Det är jag som, är jag som räknas, är det inte så? Nej, men stort tack eh, Antti, Martin och Lars för väldigt bra eh, presentationer. Eh, forskningen fortsätter hörni. Det finns mer att lära om den finska modellen och vad som kommer att hända med den. Men jag vill också göra ett litet sånt, det finns lite litteratur för den som är intresserad av att förkovra sig ytterligare om detta på bordet längst bak i rummet. Så man får jättegärna ta med sig en bok eller, en, eller en, ett papper när man går härifrån. Så stort tack från oss för idag.